You ready? Am I talking first? After the course, you don't talk. It's on, it's on. All right, welcome everybody. If we could have your attention, please. All right, thank you so much for coming to our first annual Uncovering Stories event sponsored by Open Up Resources. I wanna start by sharing a big thank you to the Open Up Resources company and team for not only sponsoring this, but helping us organize this event. Can we all give a big round of applause to Open Up Resources? Yeah, I've been to a lot of parties. Open Up knows how to throw a party. So I just want to say that. Um, tonight is going to be an uh, exciting night of storytelling. I just want to first thank all of the storytellers for being vulnerable and sharing their stories. I also want to thank Chris for ag agreeing to be our MC for tonight. So shout out to Chris. And I want to thank everybody on my team that helped and volunteered here tonight. But I'm going to stop talking because who you need to hear from are these storytellers. So if you could please join us and come down here, we're going to start a party. And I'm going to hand it off to Chris. All right, everybody, everybody. I know everyone throughout the building is having an amazing time. But, but as we get ready for the speakers, even if you're in other rooms, we can still hear you all. So feel free to come to the main room to see them live. Feel free to watch it on the TVs. When we're playing music, you can dance, cut up, and do all the things. As people are speaking, just make sure everyone throughout the building can, uh, is respectful of the speakers so we can hear. Fair enough? All right, on behalf of Open Up Resources, I'm going to be joined by Rachel Martinez, our Chief of Staff. We want to thank NCSM for providing us the opportunity to host this event. Really quick, if you're an Open Up Resources employee, raise your hand. If you're an Open Up Resources employee, raise your hand. Everyone give it up for Open Up Resources throughout the building. We have the most amazing team in all of the world, and we are truly thankful on behalf of our CEO, Jason Isaacs. Anything we missed? No, you nailed it. We good? good job. All right. So, all right, let's get this party started. So we are live on YouTube. If you know people that are not here, go to YouTube, MCSM's page, and you can see everything. And last but not least, before we get started, you can go ahead, go ahead. All right. You can hang with me? All right, hang with me a little bit. <laughs> Real quick, if you're enjoying the conference, make some noise. <laughs> that was kind of weak. I know it's in the evening. If you're enjoying the conference, make some noise. <laughs> All right, this is the best and the hypest event at the conference of every single piece that we have going, uncovering stories. Again, we're happy to be a part of it drink, eat, have a great time. But these four speakers that are coming tonight are the most dynamic speakers I've ever heard, and I've heard a lot of people in this time. So our first speaker is coming live from Orlando, Florida. Y'all gotta give it up for Florida now. We do a lot of amazing things in Orlando, Florida, especially at the University of Central Florida. Real quick plug, all right. 
Our first speaker has four adjectives to describe her, driven, hopeful, passionate, and resilient. Everyone welcome the very first Uncovering Story speaker, Abby Ruiz. And Abby has really, I'm giving it out, Abby is going through a voice piece and overcoming a little cold, but Abby is still about to rock it tonight. So she, Abby, show them how to do it. You ready? Let's roll. Give it up for Abby. Hey everybody. All right. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Abby Ruiz from Orlando, Florida. I apologize for sounding like a frog, but here I am. I'm happy to be here with you. So here's a phrase that we rarely hear in math spaces. I want to tell you a story. It's funny because as math leaders and educators, we often rely on concrete and numerical data to make sense of how to best support the students that we serve. But Dr. Brene Brown tells us that stories are data with a soul. So as data-driven people, we have to give our stories room at the table. So growing up as a Mexican-American kid, I was raised with the wisdom of my parents who often explained the world around me through Mexican proverbs. And one proverb that has really resonated and stuck with me, and that often comes up in moments of joy or adversity, like losing your voice, is, si se puede. Si se puede. That's right. Or, yes, it is possible. It is my beacon of hope when I'm overcoming obstacles, but also my declaration of triumph when I finally overcome any hurdle. When I was a little girl, my family immigrated from Mexico to Florida in efforts to, you know, have a better life for us because si se puede. My dad worked as a farm worker in the field harvesting sugarcane in Belgrade, Florida. Meanwhile, my mom, my sister, and I would wake up each morning at dawn to cook and sell food out of the hotel room where we all lived to make ends meet. So now that y'all have some of my data, I want to share the soul of my story. And it's accompanied by the amazing aroma of the masa that we used to make tortillas each morning. And each day, I remember my sister and I would estimate how many tortillas we would make, you know, just to make the time pass faster. And I remember one day, I actually guessed the number of tortillas right down to the T. And y'all, you couldn't tell me nothing. I was so excited. You see, my siblings and I have always been so competitive. And to this day, we compete over anything and everything. And that day was the day that I finally beat my older sister, Dulce. And I now know what I was experiencing back then. It was mathematics joy. But then, I went to class, and then I failed another of my math tests. And <clears throat> I remember thinking, how am I going to go home and tell my hardworking parents that I just can't pass these tests, that I'm just not good at math? So I went home and got the courage to tell my mom, and I could sense that she felt my sadness, and she said, and he offered me that simple yet powerful phrase, Sigue adelante, mija, si se puede. So I did. I kept trying. But if I'm honest, I never felt like I belonged in any math classroom or in school altogether. I kept going through the motions until, you know, I sat in the math classrooms and I had to repeat my mantra over and over and over. Si se puede, Abby. Si se puede. Si se puede. And I kept going. And one day, I made a very special teacher who changed my story, Ms. Yanis. She was my third grade reading teacher who saw me. She took the time to get to know me. 
she sparked that joy of learning in me. Now, y'all, don't get me wrong. I still hated math. Oh, no. <laughs> but I started to believe that learning was actually possible. Ms. Yanis helped me believe that actually, si se puede. So I took that inspiration and built upon it. And eventually, I earned my elementary education degree from the best university in the world, the University of Central Florida. That's me. I did it. I was finally a teacher who was still terrified of math. <laughs> terrified. So scared that I actually sought out a departmentalized position in third grade. Y'all, I need for you to understand this. English is my second language, and I still preferred English to math. <laughs> Until one day, I got an email from my alma mater offering an amazing and an incredible opportunity to earn a master's degree. And I was so excited. There was only one catch. It was in math and science. And here's where my sibling competitiveness really kicked in because I thought, well, nobody in my family has a master's degree yet. So I thought, si se puede, and I enrolled. Huge mistake, huge, huge. Because after all, it was still a degree in math. And my story kept taking me back to all of those failed math tests and just my imposter syndrome kept creeping in. But thankfully, I had amazing professors. Teachers who gave me the room to learn and enjoy math and see it through the eyes of my students. And one day in class, Dr. Julie Dixon, <laughs> best professor ever, she had us playing with fraction tiles. And y'all, I actually had fun. It took me right back to that day when I was a little girl covered in masa and mathematizing about tortillas with my sister. And I had a sad thought. I had never in my life experienced that type of joy inside of a classroom until then. And that's when I realized the soul to my story. I realized that I had to bring this joy back into my own classroom. I requested to be a departmentalized math and science teacher, and I've never looked back. Those are my babies. My mission is to help students experience this type of joy much sooner than I did. Because this type of revelation should not be confined to postgraduate classrooms. And because every learner deserves access to the wonder, joy, and beauty of mathematics. So I graduated with my master's degree. And now, as a third year doctoral student who specializes in mathematics education, I can proudly say, see what. So what I've learned from my story is the importance of reflection. We need to reflect on our own lived experiences and think deeply about how those experiences impact what we do in math spaces who we prioritize, who is centered, and also who is reflected. So I wanna give you a second, and I want you to think about your personal math story that has brought you here today. Do you have one in mind? And I know it's very vulnerable, but I'm gonna ask you to please share your math story with someone around you. I'll give you two minutes to do that.
All right, y'all. I hate to interrupt. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your math stories. I know it's a vulnerable thing to do. So what I want us to do is I want us to keep... Thank you. <laughs> so sorry, y'all. I wish I could do my teacher voice, but as you can hear. So what I want us to do is I want us to keep those math memories present. Because it's those stories that help us understand the stories of others. And the reality is that every single time that you and I enter a new math space, there are stories that are being actively written. So here is my challenge to everybody here. I want to challenge you to find the soul of what you learn at this conference and what you learn from each other. I want us to help create math spaces where happy math stories are written, where students can experience the wonder, the joy, and beauty of mathematics, and when learners everywhere can be empowered to say, si se puede, as they embark on their mathematical journeys. Si se puede, everybody. Thank you so much. Give it up one more time for Abby Ruiz. That was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Real quick, we want to do a quick interlude. Hey, DJ, we at a place that I think everybody may know everybody's name. I want to see. Let's go. It's hard to hear to hear the band out there. You know the song? You will sing it for us? What you got? Nothing that I like to get away. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta go where everybody knows your name. Wait, we gotta go. Don't, don't. And are always glad you came. Oh. Where everybody knows your name. Here we go. And, and everybody said you came. <laughs> You want to go where everybody knows your name. <laughs> give it up, give it up for yourselves. He was about to give y'all the extended version to keep going and going. All right, this next speaker, this next speaker is representing California. Anybody from California in the house? Oh, California is pretty deep this year. Four adjectives that describe him. Tenacious, courageous, dependable, conscientious. Everybody, I want to introduce Dr. Jordan B. Smith. I think I've arrived. You know, see, I got to take 70 years and put them down to like 10 minutes or so. But I always wanted to be in a nightclub where everybody just going to say, yeah. So what y'all do? Yeah for me. All right. So I promise you, I may not teach, but in between the Marine Corps, I was a DJ. Okay. Then I woke up and lost my mind and decided to teach math to high school students. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take you on a little trip here. I am Dr. Jordan B. Smith, Jr., and I have traveled a long way to get here. And I'm going to talk to you about why teacher leaders like me matter and why they're so important. See, I took a, a round trip from a place not too far away from here. But the truth is, the role of the teacher and the best leaders are the teacher. I am a teacher leader, I am a doctor, and I am still in the classroom. Yeah, that's me. Oh, right, then I look cute there. 
Yeah, do, but do you know what I'm up there thinking? I'm up there looking at him, I'm seeing that white beard. Now my mom said he's gonna give me something, okay? But I'm really wondering whether or not he's gonna let go of my hand. So he's got a tight grip there. But yeah, time flies. Now this is May 1968. This is my eighth grade class. What do y'all notice and what do y'all wonder about that? Now I tell you, I'm the good looking one in that first row. Okay. And if there's any doubt, I'm all the way over at the end, just let you know, okay? That's when I had hair. <laughs> but what was so important about that picture is that it was all children of color. I went to a K through eight school where everybody was black, the principals, the teachers, and everything. And when Martin, Le Martin Luther King died, okay, you got all in with the parents and they started picking out some young black male. And I was one of them. See, by the fourth grade, my parents couldn't help me with math. No, because I had a black male teacher that he was my role model. And he started having me do things like base 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up to 20. And he would showcase me at the PTA. But see, there were a lot of things going on that I was not aware of. I didn't have social media. There was no calculators, no computers. Never heard it. Didn't know when he died, but I do know he changed my life and my parents. Because one day I was sitting in a school where no blacks was going, but I was there in the back. But somebody made the mistake to say the N word. But all the heads turned around to look at me to see what my reaction is. I had a plan. See, because of him, my parents changed their mindset. Instead of sending me to the traditional all black school then the public school, my dad worked two jobs in order to make sure that I was able to go to this school. It was a prestigious school where professional football players and everything else sent their kids to. Except when I went in, there were only six blacks. But this is my stand and deliver moment. Because in order to get there, I had to take a test. You want to know what kind of test they gave me? They gave me a math test. Yeah, right, sure enough, they gave me a math test. But they didn't know who they were giving that test to. No, they had no idea. But just like stand and deliver, they gave me the test. I passed the test to the point that they wanted me to take the test again. Oh, yeah, I said, okay, come on. And guess what? I passed it, and then they gave us a scholarship. Okay. <laughs> so, at that school, I changed minds. I changed the mindsets and everything else. I became a leader. And by that time, by four years later, I set history at that school. I was fast. I could run, but not from the cops, okay? But I had a 400-yard a dash. National Honor Society got a scholarship. But the best part about it, I got an appointment to the United States Naval Academy. Now, the Naval Academy is unique. 1845, it started. But unfortunately, it took 103 years to get the first African American to graduate. 103 years, okay? The only reason Wesley Brown graduated, and there now is a building named after Wesley Brown on the, on the Academy grounds, was because of President Jimmy Carter, okay? So he spoke to him. So let me tell you about what happened when you went there. If you didn't know math, you couldn't get through those doors. But for this young man, for the four years he was at Annapolis, no one talked to him. No one would room with him. Nobody went anywhere with him except for Jimmy Carter. That's why he graduated from the Naval Academy. Now, in June 1972, ah, oh, here I am again. But I got hair. Y'all see that nice red fro? Yeah, my family used to call me Junie. Yeah, red, but I tell you, hit the sun on that hair, it looked like it was on fire. But 200 minorities entered in Annapolis. Annapolis was gonna change. In the summer of 72, I was on the drill field. The Admiral told us, look to your left and look to your right, one of you won't be here. Four years later, they were right. One of us is not there, 
I'm in there. I'm the guy in the middle. But can you imagine what's on my face there? I tell you, I'm up there wondering what the heck was I thinking? You want to know why? I went to the Navy. There ain't no swimming pools in Missouri back when I was growing up. I couldn't swim, but yet I went there. But you know what? I persevered. I could swim when I graduated, I tell you. December 72, I went home for that very first uh, Christmas Eve. And my mom was at the table, and my dad, my mom made me that chicken and rice deal. And I was enjoying and sitting there, and I sat in my uniform, rigid and everything, and I said, sir, can you please pass the salt, sir? My mom started crying. She said, oh my God, what they do to my baby? What did they do to him? My dad slept with laughing. Oh boy, they didn't made him a man, okay. <laughs> but in Ebony Magazine, in 1975, things were changing with that group of 200 that came in. If you notice, these four black midshipmen are all the class officers of the class of 75. That is amazing, okay? Things were changing. And then, Lasting impacts. This is me right when our induction day. Unfortunately, I have the date there, January 1975. When I went home for my junior year of college for a Christmas vacation, my mom went out to a New Year's Eve party, came back, and um, she complained of headaches. She had an aneurysm, and she died five years. I mean, five days later. When I came back to Annapolis, they were afraid to give me my test because they felt I was having mental issues and they wanted to give me my oral exams. I had a choice then to give up, but I had a choice to do something. See, I graduated from the Naval Academy and my brother here, four years later, he went to the Air Force Academy. So we both had a mission of things that we needed to do. By the spring set of 1976, we had our first black brigade commander in the history of the Naval Academy. And in June 1976, on the front color, cover of Jet Magazine, you got Della Reese. Hey, that's Booker T. Washington down there. Oh, but guess who's up on that top page? That's me. Yeah. Now, why did I get on Jet Magazine? Because I set history. I became the first African-American to ever receive the rank and honor to be a color company commander at the United States Naval Academy. That's me. You can check me out on YouTube. I'm not lying. Legacy of black achievement. That is me carrying those colors and over there helping out. And also, United States Naval Academy black graduates. So, my dad became proud. My dad cried when he saw this because he said, I don't have the same problems as my coworkers of going and uh, picking up their sons from jail or with drugs. All myself and my brother gave them was, was joy and reasons for him to be proud. I became a second lieutenant. We were proud. We looking sharp there in those uniforms, matter of fact. <laughs> I became a, uh, an executive officer. I became a logistician. That's where I used my math skills. Matter of fact, for Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, I wrote the mobilization SOP that put the reserves overseas for the first time. <laughs> then I became a company commander of the largest company in the United States Marine Corps, 1,371 Marines. But I have an education in arms because my mom believed in education. I have an unstated rite of passage. I told you that I was in the, in the, at the Naval Academy and I went in the Marine Corps. How in the heck did I wind up becoming a teacher? Because what I really had a love for was helping people, changing their lives. I like to impact them. And that's what I do. I work at Mountain View Alternative Schools. I have students that come to our school, have zero credits in math, and have given up hope on learning. And my job is one thing, is to restore them and give them hope and build their confidence. So to make math fun and engaging, there's two reasons I became a teacher. First, my son was failing geometry right before Thanksgiving break. 
But the second reason is I had to make a decision, but I want to make math fun and easy, you know? I wanted to make math engaging. So my question is right now, what I want you to do. I know that each one of you had a why when you just started teaching. The question is, has that why changed? So what I want you to do is turn to the next person. I want you to tell that person, why are you here today? Why are you still in education? Go ahead and turn and talk. I'm going to bring you back the Marine Corps way because I'm going to bring you back with that five, four, three, two, one. Marine Corps voice to be there. Turn and talk. Five, four, three, two, one. There's that voice. So there's four steps to become a teacher leader. I'm actually out here to recruit. That's the main reason I decided. I wanted to recruit teacher leaders. So you either know someone at your school site that needs to get out of their classroom. So to become a teacher leader, first, I had to become an effective teacher in their classroom. I had to have the mindset and determination that when my students fell, I failed. I needed a mentor, and that mentor, you probably saw her when you walked through the door. She was volunteering. She was the one that got me involved with this place, and that was Karen Lee. She was the reason that I'm still teaching. I realized that we are, have to become a change agent and you have to lead with passion and empathy. So my son called me back in the summer of 2015 and he said, Dad, I need you to write a book. I said, what do you mean write a book? And he said, well, if you don't write a book about what you went through at Annapolis, nobody ever is going to write it. And I remember I went to a Gettysburg leadership meeting uh, that was that the district paid for, and that was the one thing that one of the generals said. If he hadn't wrote the book, nobody would know the story. But see, I used this book not to sell and make money. I used this book for me and my kids and my grandkids, and also for students that get stuck that think that they can't do anything. Because of that, when I wrote that book, the superintendent found out about it, and then when we were on this trip, they had to pick one person to read the Gettysburg Address. I was chosen to read it right there on the same hollow ground. So about education, Martin Luther had it right. Intelligence plus character. Because of that and that book, then I got chosen to do a keynote for Martin Luther King's birthday for the local college. Wow. For some reason, I was being recognized and noticed. And then I actually wrote this, and I did this because of another side moment. See, I had to face death many ways in my lifetime, as I said, I'm 70 years old, is that in August 1990, I faced death with Desert Shield and Desert Storm as a veteran, Marine Corps, 20 years. But in June 2017, I went on a routine doctor visit with my wife, and all of a sudden the doctor with the test came back, she had stage four cancer. So for two years, I went to work and school and did other things and still had to come back and take care of my, my wife that was dying, that was terminal for the next two years, right before COVID hit on top of it. But then the reason I wrote the book is because my wife said, there were things that we went through that nobody else told us. And she said, we don't want anybody else to go through those same things. And I was, you know, I thought I knew everything. Yeah, I'm a math guy. You know how we are. So, but it turned out that I had to go through that. Okay, I had to go through it. And so I wrote that. And the reason is I began, became overconscious about cancer. And then it really hit home. In February, I got diagnosed with cancer of this year. And the only reason they caught it was because in the book. There were certain things that it, they told me. One was that if you've ever been a smoker, you better make sure you get a CT scan every year for 10 years after you stop smoking. No doctor told me that, okay? That's why my wife died from lung cancer. So because of that, we were able to find it. And I'm here today because now my PSA is 1.9 and I'm in remission. 
So when I thought I was dying, I wanted to leave something. And so the first thing I did, I wrote this book about teaching strategies. Remember, I'm in this school where these students come that have given up on learning. What the heck was I doing to help them graduate? And the reason is I started putting those in and started collaborating, and that's why I did it. But I'm a teacher leader in the classroom. Believe it or not, I'm out of my classroom 25 days a year. But yet, when I go back to my classroom, because I'm leaving here and going to CMC, when I go back, I already know right now that my students are producing and earning credits. They actually produce more credits and stuff when I'm gone. How in the heck did I get that? Okay, so I did that. But the reason is, is because I believe in inclusion. I teamed together for two years before the pandemic with a special ed teacher where we had general education and special ed kids in the same classroom. You can walk in and you would not know you would not know who they were. Teachers, in order to be effective, need to be these, uh, these things. But the primary thing is productive and also a dedication. But uh, along that way, I realized in my classroom as a teacher that there was 12 rules that I needed to follow. The first one, it really hits home, was respect. I had to have empathy and also courage. Courage had to be essential for us to do anything. The question is, are you courageous? Do you have the courage to become a teacher leader from within the classroom or even find ones? Why don't you turn and talk 30 seconds. Tell the person right next to you whether or not you got the courage to be a teacher leader. Five, four, three, two, and one. The other six rules, relationships, change agent. And you know, confrontations are gonna happen. You just gotta know how to deal with that. But the last rule, never stop learning. Never, ever stop learning. So these are the things that I've done outside, and I just put those up there just to let you know my path. I used to be a teacher in the classroom that only dealt with my students. Never went anywhere else, no PD or anything. But as a result, my spirit has grown. The one thing I really like, I graduated from Annapolis. I'm on the Service Academy uh, selection committee for a congressman that I get to choose and help which ones get nominated to the academy. If I couldn't do enough, I know my, 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 my co-partners co over here, they keep beating me up and they were beating me up before I got up here though. So I have a unique principle that I never go to him with a problem. If something is wrong, I am gonna to go to him. I said, this is the problem, but I recommend A, B, or C. And then he says, he picks one, or I pick one, and I say, fine, can I execute? And I walk out the door. And then I come back and give him follow-up. I never, never leave him with just a problem. So I lost my mind three years ago, and <laughs> I decided that I needed to have kids have an opportunity to more pathways, a direct pathway and a door to making money. Some teacher in my school sent me an email about this Amazon Future Engineer program. She sent it to me, I had not interested, it brought my interest and I went to go get certified for an AP computer science principal class. The only requirement is you needed a math degree. I had that. They paid for it for me to go to it free. I went there, I come back, I complete it. I come to my principal and I said, I wanna teach AP computer science. He says, do you realize you're at a continuation school? I said, yeah. He let me do it. And so the end result is that we wind up having students actually take the AP course, actually take the AP exam, and pass the AP exam. So because of that, Amazon awarded me $30,000 and made me a teacher of the year here in May of this 2023. And as I speak here today, I get an email that was concerning our students and stuff. So I started with three, 
but right now I have 17 students at a continuation school that will be taking AP tests this next year. So now I'm an ambassador. I just showed you that. I'm spreading the word. There was a problem with diversity inside the computer science classrooms, and so I wrote about that. Again, I thought I was dying. But the real thing I started everything with was to make math fun. When I leave here and go back to my school, 600 elementary kids are coming to our school. We set up our gym with all these games, and the kids come in and do station rotation to do the math. And so I got 600 elementary kids. That's making math fun. That's what I really like. So this is my life in a, in a actually a capture from the drill field to the Marines, to community service, to advocacy, speaking with um, a congressman. But this is the real reason. See, both of these kids came to me with zero credits in math. I mean, really, they had no in their scales. But what I did was actually, to actually was test these students and they were very low. The end result is that both of these students have passed. They actually graduated and got their high school diploma. So, but how did I do that? This is how I did it. And this is what happens with every student. And I please hope you pass it on. I'm not sure if everybody's seen this, but see this first pathway? I actually get a marker and I draw it out on the table for my students. I said, this is your pathway before you got here. And we start with kindergarten. I said, there was something in kindergarten that you didn't get. So we put a little hole there. And then you get to the second grade, more holes. Third grade, fourth grade, where everybody knows the picture, right? By the time they get to high school, then they get the chance to wake up. Because all of a sudden, they go that first semester, and they fail because they didn't know those concepts, and they get zero credits. And then somebody believes in giving them math one and then going to math two, and so on. The end result, they get frustrated by the time they come to see me. I sat down with them and I said, I'm not going to do the same stupid stuff. I said, I'm a doctor. We're going to go ahead and do, run some tests. We're going to figure out what's wrong. Then I'm going to prescribe a solution. I said, is that okay with you? I get buy-in. But how do I really keep them working is that I show them this one. So I want to know what you wonder about this. What do you see? Take a look at it. What do you see? You see potholes, uh-oh. No, you, no, no, you keep a little bit there. What do you see? You see frames? You need lines? You see patterns? Uh, can anybody see any circles? Uh, take a look, ooh, come on. Can you see, can you see circles? Oh. How many people can see the circles? Raise your hand. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, the circles, really? The circles up there. What? You, are you, you still can't see the circles? Try harder. Try harder. Watch the circle. Ah, uh, now do you see the circles? How many circles can you see now? 16, four rows, 16 circles. But you got it? You sure? All right, now close your eyes. Now open them back up again. Can you still see the circles? Oh, I bet you can't. I bet you can't let them go away. This is what I do for each and every one of my students. I get by and with them on those potholes that they have problems that exist. We agree that they need to work on it. But then I need intrinsic and extrinsic motivation for these students. And what I do is I show them this. And then I relate the analogy. See, learning math is just like this diagram. At first, when you looked at it, you didn't see anything. You didn't understand it. It wasn't even clear. Even though some of them around you, your peers, saw it, you didn't. But finally, someone showed you the circle and now you see all of the circles. That is what we call productive struggle. And that is how I get those students to turn their lives around. Yeah. So with that, never stop learning. And I know I went a little bit over, but 
I just had to let it go. So, I'm Dr. Smith. This is my story. Uh, you don't have it. It's all good. Thank you. Give it up again for Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith. Real quick, with the open up team join me real quick, with the open up team join me real quick on the steps. One of the things we've been telling you all all week um, on social media is we have big announcements throughout. And we saved the biggest announcement that we have for tonight to share with you all before our next speaker. And I want the entire team to join me because it's not just Chris Childs, it's literally an entire group of folks from around the country that work with us at Open Up Resources. Really, really quick with this, our goal as a team is to reimagine what is mathematics, what it does, and how it can impact children as they move forward. In the organization, this is what we live by, this whole concept of centering classroom equity. If you see our presentations, you're gonna see this embedded throughout as we move forward, and it rests upon three pillars. One, access. All of the materials that we provide are openly accessible. Anyone can go online to openupresources.org and access high quality materials in English and language arts. The second piece, all of the materials are high quality. All of our mathematics programs are highly rated by All Green on air reports, so we don't sacrifice the quality of the materials to make them openly accessible. And last but not least, Open Up Resources has the best, the best professional learning in the world. They have the best communities in the world and the best professional PLCs in the world. And with all of those pieces coming together, we center on classroom equity. Equity is important to us because we really want to make sure every single child is seen within the curriculum experience. It's not just talking about are the materials culture responsive? It's not about, oh my gosh, we put an ethically sounding name in a word problem. It's not, oh my gosh, we just put a nice picture of a child in there. It's about how do we authentically tell everyone's story within the mathematics experience? So what we're gonna do is unveil to you all, for the very first time ever, we're gonna be offering a brand new pre-K-5 mathematics program called Humanizing Mathematics. <laughs> Y'all can give it up. Within this program, it is truly the first culturally responsive program. And when we say culturally responsive, we mean all ch children seeing themselves and the majority of children who are in the school seeing themselves. Because current curriculums do have some cultural responsiveness, they're just not responding to the children that are in our classrooms. So with this curriculum, the big things that we have within this curriculum are, one, it's gonna be openly accessible. It's gonna be a proprietary offering by Open Up Resources, our first proprietary mathematics offering. It's gonna have mathematical spotlights throughout the entire program. We also have financial literacy things in the program for elementary children to learn things that are gonna make be relevant to their lives. Also, we have embedded the equity-based practices by Danny Martin, Julia Aguirre, and Karen Mayfield Ingram. So it's not just saying equity for the sake of equity. We've made a program top to bottom that has all of the things embedded within it. And if you look at the second bullet, we did not sacrifice professional learning because it's not about just creating materials. We have the best professional learning to make sure teachers around the country know how to access the materials. So the first release for you all, if you scan the QR code throughout the building, You'll get access to the website. We're going to give you a handout as we leave, and we're going to start dropping throughout 2024 different pieces of the program that I guarantee you is going to change the game for schools. And I only gave you all 10% of the stuff that's in the program. I got a whole 90% that this team has worked together to put together for you all. But most importantly, we're going to impact children, we're going to impact families, and we're going to change the game of what it means to teach mathematics education. So let's open up resources. So one more time, give it up for this amazing team at Open Up and everybody around the country that does this work. All right, our next speaker coming straight out of Virginia by way of Kentucky. Yeah. Okay, Kentucky by way of Virginia. Four adjectives, curious, resourceful, social, and resilient. 
I want to introduce, and I want you all to give it up throughout the entire building for Dr. D. Crescitelli. Hi, y'all. I am an Appalachian. My story is an Appalachian tale. I am a product of the Southwest Virginia mountains. I am a coal miner's daughter. My mom married my dad when she was a senior in high school and he had dropped out in the 10th grade. My parents worked very hard, often at multiple jobs, to provide for their four children, but I spent most of my childhood in poverty. That's me, Dee Dee Williamson, on my first birthday. Childhood is innocence. Sweet little smiles on dirty faces, saying thank you, not even knowing what the words mean. Being daddy's little girl, but when grandpa asks, you're his too. Childhood is questions. Mommy, why? Why is the sky blue? Why can't Susie come stay tonight? Why can't I go out tonight? Mommy, why are you crying? Childhood is over. You have to grow up fast in poverty. It's just a necessity. Poverty is a green lunch ticket. When I was a kid, the free and reduced lunch tickets were green, so everybody knew who the poor kids were. Poverty is one bath drawn for four kids to take a bath in because you have to ration water. Poverty is waiting in a very long line at the county fairgrounds for a block of cheese and some rice that didn't last very long. My mom's food was very tasty, but there often wasn't enough. Poverty is pervasive in Appalachia. The counties you see on that map in blue are where people live at, 20% of the people or more live well below the poverty line. And that's a lot of blue. In fact, in 2022, of the 10 poorest counties in the entire United States, six of them are situated in Appalachia and not in just the places you would assume. Allowing sin at that level anywhere is something we need to address. Yeah. Students in Appalachia get mixed messaging from their schooling. This is from a professional development system used much of the country and in many of the places where I work. Students are given this message from their teachers because teachers are given the message that in order for them to succeed, they have to leave. What students internalize is they gotta rise above their raising and that their family is what's holding them back. On the other hand, we have well-meaning teachers who in order to make kids' lives not so hard, make school a place where there's absolutely no struggle. I call that loving them dumb. We meet them where they are, and then we leave them there. We, it's okay, baby, you don't have to worry about that until they are multiple grade levels behind. It is head spinning to me that we're still sending these same messages that I heard as a student in the 1970s and 80s. I internalized the gotta rise above my raising message. I left home, I went to school in Appalachia, got married at 20, one of the last in my entire graduating class from high school to do so, took more years than I care to admit to get out of that abusive relationship. Worked in higher education in Appalachia and in New England, where I met a New Yorker, and I brought him back with me to Appalachia. 
where I then had to take care of one and then another of my parents because of lack of good health care, but also the ravages of addiction, both real Appalachian problems. But I also got to teach in the middle school where I had been a student, where I met a student named Carl. He's my why, if you've noticed all the whys tonight, right? And he told me once, when I asked for his explanation about part of a, a math problem, he said, can't expect nothing of me, Miss Crescitelli. I'm from off Mud Fork. My answer was, well, so am I, Carl. You know that man y'all call Crazy Old Alfred? That's my dad, so I can totally expect something from you. I decided right then and there, when his eyes popped open so wide, that I was gonna do everything within my power to help these kids write a new story for themselves, to help them see their strengths, to help them see their potential. I am a storyteller, and I'm telling you my story, but it's also the story of my people. I see wholeheartedness, family solidarity, hospitality, love of place, sense of beauty, sense of humor, and self-reliance in my people. I need others to see that too. These are actual statements from that PD program I told you about earlier. I want you to take a second and read those. Feel the anger that I think you might feel. And then what I want you to do is think about how we might reframe this deficit thinking. What might students and teachers need to hear instead? And what I want you to do is use the talk time for my talk to talk to others in this room about your reactions, but also other ways to maybe think about this. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. There are two conflicting things happening in the world where I live and work with professional development. On the one hand, we have strength-based teaching. We are thinking about looking from students' access. But on the other hand, we have all of these professional development programs and much of the media talking about a culture of poverty and describing what is happening as my students needing to be fixed, right? I need us to stop that message, right? There's nothing wrong with my students, right? There's something wrong with the system. So, 
So I really mean it when I say I'm interested in your thoughts on those things. So that th this will take you to a Padlet where if you want to just share your, oh my God, why is this happening reactions, or if you have ideas, I would love to hear them. Uh, the program is Ruby Payne's Understanding Poverty, and she doesn't. She does not. She does not. She doesn't know my people, right? Um, so, but I really need you to help me to do this. <laughs> I really need you guys to help me with this, right? Because when they see their potential, it's amazing, right? Pointing out Carl's strengths helped him see himself as a high school graduate. And so he became one, the first one in his family. Thank you for listening to my Appalachian tale, my story of place value, the, ba the value of a place, Appalachia and its people, my people. Give it up, give it up again for D. Make some noise. All right, before this last speaker, hey, DJ, drop a hit for us real quick before this last speaker. Who know this song? Karen, you gonna sing again for us in the room? No. No? But always. And we want everybody in the main room for the last speaker for the grand finale. Everybody get ready for the grand finale. All right, real quick, real quick, before we bring up this last speaker, wait, wait, first, give it up for all the speakers. They've been amazing so far. Before we give it up for the last, get up for the last speaker, I want to do two quick thank yous. First, I want you all to give it up to Georgina. This was her, her idea. She conceptualized it. Give it up for her. And with her, she reached out and said, hey, Chris, would you host? I said, of course, I got you. And thank you for the opportunity. But this was her idea. And she did an amazing job with her team putting it together. Second, second, I want to give it up to Bria. Bria reached out to me on the Monday after she found out I was hosting and said would open up sponsor it on a Monday. And I said, let me think about it, how much? She gave me the number on the Monday. I took a deep breath and say, I'm gonna have to talk to you on like a Friday or the following Monday. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I told my team about the event and we reached, I think I told her within a couple hours, we're gonna sponsor the event. And I also told her for what the sponsorship package was, it was gonna cost a lot more to make an amazing event. And I said to her, I'm going to go over and above to make sure you have an amazing event far beyond the sponsorship package. And I maintain that commitment to Bria and to Georgina. So on behalf of Open Up Resources, thank you all. All right, this last speaker coming live from, North we should have did like the Chicago Bulls theme song, coming live out of North Carolina. Wait, North Carolina, y'all gotta get more noise. Coming live from North Carolina. This next, this next speaker is creative, passionate, loyal, and inspirational. Everyone give it up to the one, the only, James O'Neill! All right, I am Last, before you all are dismissed to do whatever you're going to do for the rest of the night, um, whatever that may be, but I am James O'Neill, and I'm super excited to be with you all today. 
and to share my story. And so to start my story off, I want to start off with a poetic monologue of how I became a teacher when one teacher changed my life and it's called Be A Door. Sitting in class, watching those who are the complexion of the opposite leave. As they relieve themselves from being in class full of those who are the complexion of me. It wasn't hard to see that the inequality symbols that I was learning in math, they not only apply to numbers, these inequalities I learned real quick applied to colors. Shades of brown invisibly crowned with dunce became fitted to heads that seemed to learn at exponentially slower rates than others. Though we were an integrated school, the gifted segregated themselves through the white flight of Jim Crow's wings, enacting their civil rights of separate but equal PLCs that excluded NAACPs because where I was from, this practice of low expectation for black boys was the norm. Until one day, a young white lady who taught Algebra one in eighth grade gave two black boys a math test that went against the pedagogy of low expectations. She saw in us the same desire to learn. It was just wrapped in brown skin that identified as black. She chose to see color because she recognized that everyone that was in her advanced math classes, they were white. She chose to rescue us from a curriculum that handed out six degrees of separation, Southern, black, poor, male, non-gifted, therefore unlikely. She changed my best friend Chester and my life. It wasn't as if I didn't believe I could do it. She believed I could. Her expectations of me tore down walls built by bricks of shame, inequity, and I asked myself daily, what's wrong with me? Her expectations of me exposed me to a land of possibilities found only in books where fairy tales exist, and those that were asleep there were awakened by a kiss. She became the Peter Pan to two lost boys, giving us access to Neverland. In this land where I had never been, all those that were here, they were expected to succeed. They were expected in high school to take honors in AP courses, something I knew nothing about. One of the proudest moments of my life was walking down my freshman high school hallway during freshman orientation, when a welcoming tone of normalcy reached out to me like a slick arm stretch at the movies and said, hi. I'm your freshman English nine teacher. In one split second, the eloquence of Malcolm, the bravery of Rosa, the championing of Du Bois courageously spoke no. Ma'am, I have honors. After being on this earth for 14 years, it was in that English honors class that I first learned about the Holocaust through our summer book reading night by Ellie Wiesel. All I had ever learned about was the enslavement of Africans. I had no clue that darkness had descended upon a face of people whose skin complexion was the very opposite of the book's name. This blew my mind as the winds of equity began to thrust me into competitive GPAs of those of my white peers because honors and AP courses gave you a half to a whole grade point. Could this be one reason why black and brown faces perform so poorly? Because the bandwidth carrying our information was on dial up speed. 
while fibers of interconnected networks sped up the advancement of those privy to a system that supported them and not those that looked like me. The expectations of my teacher had me in class asking Ashley Woolard for homemade deer jerky because it was hunting season in North Carolina. I don't think y'all get it, but I'm trying to be funny, so let me just come out and just say it real clear. Uh, black people don't hunt. <laughs> it's, just, it's just something. I know somebody's saying, like, you can't say that about all black people, so let's do some math. If this screen represented all the black people in America, this would be the percentage of us <laughs> that hunt. This, <laughs> y'all making me laugh. <laughs> was my exposure to diversity. But in all seriousness, I begin to walk a trail of tears, this time paved by my ancestors, just to be draped in cords. These shackled them. Yet these loosed me. To pursue the dreams of a king. In eighth grade, I fell in love with math. And for over 15 and a half years, I found myself teaching in the same grade and subject where one teacher's expectations of me changed the course of my life. And for that, I want to say thank you, Mrs. Simmons. So we've been doing this turn and talk all night. And so here's my turn and talk. I have a question for you. Who was your Mrs. Simmons? It doesn't have to be a teacher, but I'm asking who lit the fire for your love for math education? If you can turn to your neighbor, your elbow neighbor, and about for a minute and a half, we'll just discuss who your Mrs. Simmons was. Already set, go. Forty five seconds. Thirty seconds. Bringing you back in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. If you can do yourself a wonderful favor and say thank you for sharing to your neighbor. So as I close tonight, I want to talk to you all about teacher power. 
As I go and I speak or I consult or I coach or do professional development for teachers and leaders, I want to ground them in the power we have in our decisions that we make on a daily basis. And so as math educators and as leaders, we can either be the ceiling where students have to break through our beliefs about them our ideologies about them, our misconceptions, our biases, our low expectations, and though they can break through, it's gonna be a messy process getting through our ceiling of them. Or we can make the decision to be a door where we give them access to the bright future they deserve because we believe they deserve it. I want to talk to you about a time that I made a decision to be a door. When you look on the left, this is our field trip. We, um, when I taught my last year in a classroom in Charlotte, uh, we went to the Outer Banks as an eighth grade field trip to the beach. And we took, we were crazy, like four nights and three days at the beach and in, a, in the Ramada, or one of my students says, the, the Ramada, the Ramada, that's what she called it. <laughs> Ramada Inn. I was like, girl, that is not Ramada. <laughs> but we went there and we kept our kids there. And we were a very diverse school, one of the best schools, I believe, in Charlotte and North Carolina. But um, we were a very diverse school. In fact, 85% of our students identified as black or brown. Out of that 85%, 60% of our students identified as black. Out of that 60%, about 30% or half identified as black boys. And my business is really designed to promote all by promoting black boy brilliance. And so in our classrooms or at our school, we had the ability or we had the opportunity to have accelerated math, where math in the high school was pushed down to eighth grade and students could access accelerated math. In North Carolina, we had math one, integrated math one, and integrated math two. And so students in eighth grade could take integrated math one for the entire year, or they had the option to take math one once a semester and math to the second semester, which was the highest level of math offered at our school. And so when you looked in those classrooms, those demographics were very different. In fact, they look racially like this. And they didn't represent the school that I was at. In fact, I was there for two years and there were 0% of black boys in that classroom, though that school made up 30% of black boys at that school. And so I decided that I wanted to open the door to the brilliance of everyone to, be, to see black boys in a space where they belong. So ask me how. So at our school, y'all, y'all, <laughs> woo, y'all are involved today. I love it. <laughs> I don't know if it's the drinks or I'm just engaging. I don't know. I don't know. But y'all are y'all are y'all are doing it. So uh, at our school, we had <laughs> we had club days, and so on club days, um, we literally at six block at the end of the day on Mondays, a teacher would sponsor a club that had nothing to do with school or anything like that. And so I started a, a club called. I taught my kids how to play cards. And so I taught them all the card games that I learned as a kid, and I finally got to spades, and it was over. And if you know, you know that once you teach somebody how to play spades, you don't want to play anything else. And so I decided that I was going to change my club. Instead of doing a spades club, I would start after math. And so, y'all know I like poetry, and so follow along with me. Aftermath is a club aftermath class that focuses on the aftermath of black boys pursuing aftermath. Okay, y'all got it? We don't need to do a three reads of this? Y'all got it? Okay. All right, so after math, the boys would come to me in sixth grade, and they would stay in my club from sixth grade to seventh grade. I had to do a lot of convincing because it was a math club, and these are sixth grade boys, and so I went to their parents, that's how I did that, and said, well, I'm promoting equity by keeping these boys because at the end of, my seventh grade, of their seventh grade year, by the time they got into eighth grade, I wanted all those boys to be in a math one class and then some of them to qualify for a math one two class. That was the goal of the club. As of, uh, I wanted to be a door and because of that we saw a significant increase in black boys taking math one and math one two at our school but wait there's more <laughs> 
And uh, every year, about five to six boys who was in our club qualified or uh, tested into math one, two, and they all scored fives on their EOC end of course test, which is the highest that they could score on their test in the 95th to the 99th percentile of all students in the state. And then lastly, at least 80% of those boys remained on the honor roll throughout their entire school year. Why am I sharing this with you? It is teacher power. I want to say this before I leave. I did not write a grant. I did not go to the state. I did not talk to the Board of Education. I started a club because I believed that I could change that demographic and I want it to ultimately be a door. And so what I ask you all, no matter what role you're in, no matter what you're doing, I encourage you and I charge you to be a door. Thank you. Give it up, give it up again for James O'Neill. Really quick, really quick. First, I want everyone to make all the noise you can for bus boys and poets. They came through in the clutch for us. And if all the speakers will come up to the stage, will all the speakers come up to the stage? So I just wanted to take a moment and thank all four of our storytellers for their vulnerability, for taking hours of time on Zoom. We practice on Zoom, we practice in person, and I just want to say I know that I'm a better person because I know these four amazing storytellers. Give it up for all four of them. Right? Yes. Thank you to Open Up for believing in this event and sponsoring it. Thank you, Chris, for emceeing. And I, on behalf of NCSM, we have journals for you so you continue to tell your stories. We love you. We're grateful. Thank you. And we want to thank each and every one of you for spending your evening with us. We're going to post all the things on social media. We'll keep the YouTube feed up. Enjoy the night. Enjoy the remainder of the conference. DJ, the rest of the night is yours. Everyone have a great, great evening. Be safe.